Good morning. You made it here. Congratulations. Can you turn to the people around you? Because we want to make sure this, if this is your first time, we don't want it to be your last time at Gateway. Just say hi. Welcome to Gateway. Go ahead. Shake some hands. Hug some necks. You can stand up out in the courtyard, online. How you doing? Well, this morning we're going to be in the Bible. We are Gateway Bible Church, and so I would like you to open the Bibles to Luke chapter 11, and I'll be in various passages this morning. Make sure you get your notes. If you haven't gotten one of these, we want to encourage you to get one of these. Uh, Our ushers can give you one. You just raise your hand about now, and usher will just magically appear out of nowhere and maybe give you one, maybe go out in the courtyard as well. Uh, make sure that you guys get one of these. In the back of this Ask God booklet, there's just actually prompts for you, encouragements to pray if you've never prayed, if you've never actually done any fasting and prayer to encourage you to do that, and then a schedule each day of the week. So I want to say special uh, hi to our online audience, everybody online watching us today from home, especially Sheila and Sandy and Daryl, because I know you're watching every week faithfully, and many others who are there Good to see you this morning. Good to see all of you here and grateful that you've come because uh, all this stuff happens because really not, not that it's necessarily Ron or Dave or, or Ryan are great. It's because we have a great tech team here. Can you just give our tech team a hand? Yes. Uh, they've been doing a great job and uh, we want to encourage them. I was thinking about the new year and how to really kick off this whole series of the new year as we go into shine and everything like that to think about like a phrase. Uh, and I thought, well, the new me in 2023, how's that? Does that sound good? Or, or, or how about something like the Lord in me in 23, right? Yeah. Or how about this one? This is really important for me. Shay is my baby in 23. Okay. All right. That's my wife. Don't you be saying that because that's my wife. All right. We're going into the year of prayer. And when you talk about prayer and fasting, uh, not, not too many people get all that excited. But there has been a group of people here every morning at 7 a.m. meeting right here in the chapel to pray for about a half hour. And some of you are fasting throughout the week. Some of you can't make it at 7 and you're doing that prayer time during the week. Thank you, thank you, thank you. But we're going to be doing these 21 days and ending January 29th with a time of worship and prayer. And you don't want to miss that with David Matsumura and the band there on the 29th. There'll be more information coming. Uh, Jesus, last week, we saw he taught us how to pray. And uh, we saw that in Matthew. We see it here in Luke 11. And uh, today we're going to deal with the question... Why doesn't God answer my prayer? Why didn't he answer the prayer that I asked? How many people in this room, you've had an unanswered prayer? It's okay, you're in church. Unanswered prayer. It's all right. Yeah, right? Uh, we all have this in our lives, so it's a great one to ask. I, I think it was just an interesting little story about a pastor who would, who would uh, every morning before he'd get up and preach... He would bow his head, and he had a five-year-old daughter, and his little five-year-old daughter, and said, you know, Daddy, I noticed that every, every time before you get up to preach, you bow your head. Why are you doing that? He's like, well, honey, I'm asking God to, to bless the message. And she said, well, Daddy, how come he's not doing it? <laughs> you like that one? That was a good one? You want another one? Okay, there was this guy. He was a businessman, Christian, Christian businessman, and he was, he was out in the woods camping. He didn't do this very often, but uh, he ran into a bear. And this bear started chasing him, and he, he started running like a maniac through the woods, and he was, he was praying, God praying over and over, just, God, help me, help me, help me get away from this bear. And then finally it dawned on him, I should be praying. I'm going to pray that this bear just become a Christian. <laughs> and so he prayed that prayer, and all of a sudden the bear stopped, and he looked back, and the bear was on his knees. And the bear was, mo- mo- lips were like moving. And he, he listened, he said, thank you, Lord, for the meal that I'm about to receive. <laughs> You like that one? Okay. Let me remind you that where you're, wherever, I don't think that bears pray, by the way, that it's not in the Bible. Uh, but prayer is a conversation with God. Everybody say it's a conversation. It's a conversation. It's our way of connecting with him regularly to our heavenly fathers we talked about last week. Not babbling on and on and not just being stoic and repetitive prayer, but it's a conversation And that conversation starts when you open God's word, his love letter to you, and you begin to read it, and he speaks to your heart. 
And when you read God's word, God's word starts reading you. You know what I'm talking about? And then you begin to speak back to God your requests, just like a child coming to a father. That's what we talked about. But we also said, you know, that God isn't your personal Santa Claus or genie, you know? Like if you're good all year, he'll give you what you want. He's, he's, he's not just somebody who's there in a bind. He's not a button that you actually push. He's a person so that you could have a relationship with him. And uh, the purpose of prayer, again, it's not to get what you want. You remember this last week. The purpose of prayer is to align your will with God's will. To align your will with God's will. The early church in Acts, they didn't do anything without praying. It's in every book. It, happened, it shows up in Jesus' life all the time as he was praying in his ministry. Prayer wasn't actually the power to do the ministry. Prayer was the ministry. Let that seek in. It's not just what we do before we do ministry. It was the ministry, and it is the ministry for you in your life with your heavenly Father. Jesus himself said in John 15, you can do nothing apart from me. You can do nothing. And and we need to stay connected to God, and that's how we do that, through the word, through prayer. By the way, through fellowship with other believers as well. That's why we're encouraging you to sign up for a life group and get connected to other believers. And I'm concerned that that what was fundamental in the New Testament church has become supplemental at Gateway Bible Church. Remember I said last week, instead of it being the meat and potatoes in the New Testament, it's become like a vitamin that we take as a supplement instead of a place of dependency, knowing that everything flows from that connection with the Lord. So again, how many of you believe in the power of prayer? I know you do because it's been raining, right? (laughs) I also know because the 49ers won yesterday, right? Now stop praying the, the rain prayer. Keep praying the 49ers prayer, okay? All right. Uh, Again, the greatest motivation to prayer is answered prayer. Do you know what I'm saying? You see an answered prayer, you're all motivated to pray, all right? But the the opposite has its effect as well. When we don't see answered prayer, we actually, and some of you, are questioning God and maybe even thinking about stepping away from your relationship with God. It's caused unbelief. Unanswered prayer reminds me of a Garth Brooks song that was in 1991. I'm sorry, but I was alive then. I was two. Anyway, uh, Unanswered Prayer was the song, Unanswered Prayer. Some of you know this because you're country music fans, but this was actually an experience that he had on his, on his own. In high school, he went to a football game to his old high school, and he saw this girl that he hadn't seen for a long time. And in high school, this girl that he saw, she was, he thought that she was like, it. Like, this is the girl for me. He was wild crazy over her. She was pretty good looking, and he prayed to God many times that she would become his, his wife. And it didn't happen, and he sees her all these years later, and he wonders, what was I thinking? <laughs> like, saw this. He's like, what was I thinking? And he whispers under his breath, thank God. Thank God. In fact, one of his lines in the song is, some of God's greatest gifts are unanswered prayers. You got some good gifts like that? You know what I'm talking about? I remember I went to my 20 years anniversary or so. I'm just going to say or so. Anyway, I get together with people in my class, and there was a girl that I was really thought she was talented and gifted and beautiful and all this. And I prayed many times. I'm sure I prayed many times that she would become my wife. But then, then uh, when I saw her, I, I looked over, and I saw her lips move and say, thank God. <laughs> Turn the person next to you and say, you're probably somebody's unanswered prayer. No, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. Unanswered prayer, we've all experienced it. Luke 11, I want to show you really briefly in Luke 11 and then give you some reasons, potential reasons through the Bible why there's unanswered prayer. Luke 11 says, one day Jesus, verse 1 says, Jesus was praying in a certain place when he had finished. You remember, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. Say, I want to pray. I want to know how. I want to know how, so teach us. And then verse 5, Jesus said to them, this is after the Lord's Prayer, suppose you have a friend, and you go to him at midnight and say, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and I have no food to offer them. And suppose the one inside answers, don't bother me. The door's already locked, and my children and I are in bed. Because why? It's at night. I can't get up and give you anything. Verse 8, I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, 
He will surely get up and give you as much as you need. Verse 9, so I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. The one who seeks, finds. The one who knocks, the door will be opened. Father, we thank you for your word. We ask, God, that you would speak to our hearts. Take away every distraction in the name of Jesus right now. Lord, there are those here I know are questioning. They've got a lot of questions about why their prayers haven't been answered. But Lord, I pray that you would be very clear by the power of your spirit to speak to them at home as they're watching, out in the courtyard, and right here we pray in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Whenever Jesus teaches a parable, parable you need to know that there's, there's two people in the parable. One of them is to represent you, and one of them is to represent God. That's right. That's, that's always good in church to say God. Okay, one to represent you, and one to represent God. So in this, comparable, in this parable, it can be like really confusing when you're looking at it. Like, who in this parable is me, and who is God? So let's just say we understand if you're the friend that's asking boldly, audacious, right, shameless audacity, um, that you're asking, that makes God this grumpy confu- uh, friend who's, who's sleeping in bed and really doesn't care and is getting up begrudgingly to, to answer your prayer. But again, we need to remember that parables aren't necessarily always about comparison. They're also about contrast. Now, the friend in the story, he gets his request. Why? Because, the, 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 not because ultimately a friendship, but because he is audacious. He is bold. And he's persistent. See, God answers bold and persistent prayers. This is what Jesus is teaching his disciples. He answers these prayers. It seems as if the point is if you want something from God, you got to keep banging on the door. Right? He'll answer you because, you know, he doesn't really care. He doesn't want to be bothered. But he'll answer you because you're being persistent and bold. But actually, don't miss the point. It's to compare this. Compare this to God uh, ultimately to a a begrudging, uncaring friend, don't do that. The contrast, flip it around. Don't miss the point. Contrast, flip it around. If this begrudging friend is willing to give you something after you knock, 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 what about your heavenly father who loves you and cares for you will give you when you ask and you seek and you knock? And by, those, by that way, that's continually asking. It's ask and keep on asking. Seek Keep on seeking, knock, keep on knocking, those things. So the big question is, why didn't God answer my prayer? I did all those things, Ron. I was bold and persistent. I did all those things, but God still, this is the tension that we live in. First, it's obvious, isn't it, that the most unanswered prayer is the prayer that's never asked. Some people are real quick to to blame God for a prayer that's never been asked, right? Quickly, let me ask you, have you really asked him like this, this bold, persistent friend who asks his friend over and over again, have you been bringing your requests to God, asking him? Now, this is the hard part about prayer. Sometimes prayer can be in- incredibly powerful. I've seen God do things in prayer that is like, whoa. And then other times it can be really, really confusing because you could pray for a long time for something that you believe should happen, and God should answer this prayer, and he doesn't. Remember Elijah called down fire from heaven in the Bible and torched 800 false prophets. Pretty cool prayer to be answered, right? Uh, I prayed for a friend to be healed of brain cancer, which I thought he should have been able to be healed at 40 years old, and he wasn't. Don't understand that. It's powerful, and it's confusing. Uh, Joshua asked the sun to stand still. God, could you make the sun stand still so we can finish this battle? And it did. I mean, I prayed for a marriage that wouldn't, wouldn't die, wouldn't. And it didn't. What do you do with that unanswered prayer? Jesus fed the 5,000 with like a happy meal, right? (laughs) Right? And, uh, And I pray oftentimes for people in my family would come to know the Lord before they would die, and they didn't. Don't understand it. So let me, let me go back and just give you some biblical reasons why sometimes our prayers aren't answered. Because the Bible does show us, throughout the Bible, by the way, not just these verses that I'm going to give you today, that sometimes God doesn't answer prayers. You may be saying, I prayed, I have believed, I thought everything I did was right, and God didn't do what I thought he would do. Why, why, why? Let me be really clear on the front end of the answer why. Pastor, why? 
I got to tell you this. I don't know. I know that's unsettling, but I can tell you that the scriptures show us some patterns in our life of why God wouldn't respond. And I'm not sure why in your specific circumstance, why he didn't respond the way that you had hoped. So let's look at 1 Peter chapter uh, 3, verse 12. So you're going to have to go there quickly. I'm going to go through a various verses this morning. Let me give you some reasons. If I had cherished sin in my heart, everybody say cherished. The Lord would not have listened. The Lord would not have listened. His ear would not have been turned towards me if I cherish, hang on to, love, harbor sin in my heart. Psalm 66, 18, for the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers. Psalm 66, again, 18, his ears are open to their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. It's clear throughout the Bible, I could give you more verses, more verses to do this, uh, that one of the greatest things that prevents your prayers from getting to God is unconfessed sin. Unconfessed sin. Remember, prayer is this conversation with God. He wants a relationship with you. Prayer is actually a ministry that builds your relationship with him. And according to the Bible, sometimes our prayers aren't answered because we are harboring unconfessed sin. In other words, if there's sin in your life and you're not doing anything about it, you haven't come to God in confession, actually you, are, you can't stop thinking about this sin. It's, it's captured you. It, it, in fact, you have an alibi for your sin. You may even make excuses for your sin and say, this is just the way I am, accept me. But listen, unconfessed sin actually pushes you away from God. And the Bible says, if a person says, I do not sin. The Bible says that person is a liar and there's no truth in them. Listen, we are all sinners in this room. <laughs> the perfect person left a long time ago because we know this. Perfect person left a long time ago because we know this. We all fall into that category. But unconfessed sin, listen, there's hope for you this morning. If you have sin that you have not confessed, God makes, he opens a way for you to have forgiveness. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. He is faithful to you when you come to him in confession. Unconfessed sin, sometimes that's the answer to the unanswered prayer. That's the reason. Now let me look at uh, Matthew 5, verse 23. Jesus is saying this. He says, therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar there at altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you what does he say leave your gift leave your gift right leave it right there in the front of the altar first go and be reconciled to them then come and offer your gift our our gifts sometimes i'm sorry our prayers sometimes can be hindered by the condition of our relationships how are you doing relationally with the people around you God asks you as a believer, listen, Christian, to be a person of integrity, to be the person at home and at school and at work and at church, all the same person. So when those relationships at home and at school and at work or church are, are messed up, God is calling you to do everything you can to resolve that conflict relationally. So unresolved relational conflict is one of the reasons God may not answer your prayer. The Bible tells us, if it's up to you, be at peace with everyone. If it's up to you, as is it up to you, you do your part, in other words. You can't control other people, but if there's conflict, you do your part. Now listen, some of you, some of you are in the midst of conflict right now, and you know it. You know it because you're thinking about the person, and you're thinking about all they've done to you, or you're thinking, Pastor Ron, you have no idea what they've done to me, or what's happened in this whole situation. Listen, God tells you, forgive them. And forgiveness means that you, that you say to them, you don't owe me anything. And that you go and do your best to reconcile the relationship. But this is what I know. Sometimes you can't. But you do everything that you can do to reconcile. And you always leave the door open for reconciliation. Listen, it's sort of, uh, sort of like how I treat my parents and my, my parents. I treat my kids and my home parents. You understand this. My kids in my home, like they get real 
angry at each other sometimes. They get heated, right? A few words are shared, and then they say, can you take us to the movies? I'm like, no, I'm not taking you to the movies. Why? Well, until you start actually treating each other with love and respect in this home, because this is my home, and this is how we ought to treat each other, I'm not going to answer that request. You see, God does the same thing with us. Until you take care of that relationship, I need you to go do that. I can't tell you how many times God has said, I'm not going to tell you anything next in my heart, anything next until you do what I told you to do last. Start with obedience. Resolve the conflict. Listen, if you're harboring rage or hate or bitterness or vengeance or unforgiveness, you need to go to that person humbly. Take care of business. Leave your gift. Forget worshiping God. Forget 21 days of prayer. Go to that person. That's the priority so that God can hear you. Now, if that's not enough for you, I got another one for all the guys in the room. Guys, can you give me a, oh, all right, all right, all right. I just want to make sure you were here, all right? So ladies, if I had one, I'd give you one too, but this is one specifically for the husbands in the room, all right? Husbands in the room. Uh, basically, when you look at the Bible, uh, in short, this, this specific verse says, uh, if, if you're going to be a jerketh, I'm not going to answereth your prayereth. Okay, 1 Peter 3, 7. Let's look at that. Husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner. Now, do you want to have a discussion about weaker partner? No, let me just tell you, weaker partner does not mean that she is, she is weak and you are stronger. In fact, some of the ladies here are stronger than their husbands and they've kept quiet about it. But it's not about... It's not about Weaker is in less than, it's about strength. Naturally, God gives men stronger, bigger muscles, a bigger frame. Not always, but sometimes, okay? That's what he's talking about. And as heirs with you in the gracious gift of life. Why, why, why is he saying this? So that nothing will hinder, guys, your prayers. Gulp. You need something to take care of at home? Take care of it. Go to your wife humbly and say, I'm sorry, I was wrong please forgive me. Be considerate. Be respectful. Again, why doesn't God answer that prayer? I can't say specifically, but maybe it's a broken relationship with unresolved conflict that you need to, to address. The Apostle James is, is talking about our motives and our actions and how those work together. And he said, he's asking the question, why do you fight? Why are there fights? And why are you coveting? Why is there lusting and killing among you? And James 4, 3, he says, when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Let remind you that, that ultimately God doesn't answer to you. You answer to him. We get this all mixed up in our culture that somehow God answers to us, but we are to answer to him. He is the creator, we're the created. Sometimes we get all that backwards and we say to God, God, you need to be on my beck and call. But listen, he's not your personal butler. He's not. He isn't your spiritual blessing dispenser. Push the button, there it comes. That's not God. We often think that, that if we do certain things, we'll get what we want or what we need. Remember, the purpose of prayer is to align your will with God's will. And the reason that he doesn't answer our prayer may be because of wrong motives. Wrong motives. Ultimately, sometimes we think that we have this, this picture of God, that he's sitting waiting in heaven just to get a text from us, and ding! And in our text it says, hi God, I have a dream. By the way, it's MLK weekend, right? I have a dream, right? And here's my dream, God, so bless it, Lord. I've been good. I've been, I'm even in a life group at church, and I think I gave once. But God, I'm here, so bless me now right? And sometimes we, we think that. We think that God owes us something. Now listen, according to the gospel, he doesn't owe you anything. In fact, I think we got it backwards. He paid the debt that you owed. Romans calls it the wages of sin on a cross so that you didn't have to. In fact, he paid the whole debt of the debt that you had that you couldn't even pay interest on. He paid it all. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. White as snow. Remember, God's will isn't to get everything that you want. That's not the idea. It's that he's, 
he's ultimately, yes, wanting to answer those prayers. And sometimes when he doesn't, the ultimate goal for God is to glorify himself through you. That means when you pray for health and that health doesn't come, that even in that, God wants to be glorified, that you glorify him with whatever you have. When you pray for that great job that you hope to get, but it doesn't come, you pray for God for the provision that he did give you and he has given you. Ultimately, God wants to be glorified in whatever state that you're in. And even in death, you can glorify him. My dad used to say this, son, you got to weigh the motives of your heart. Uh, 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 Sorry, the motives against what's going on in your heart. What's happening in your heart. And I never got this because I was just like a a request machine with God. (laughs) I just constant. My dad, my dad would constantly say, son, where are your motives? I'm like, what are you talking about? Because I was young, and young men don't always know really what's going on inside. Neither do old men either. I'm just saying. So we have to reflect. What's going on in my heart? What's driving me to ask this prayer? What is that? Sometimes we get this mixed up, and we say, your will be changed, not your will be done. Your will be done, Lord. Again, wrong motives. Joyce Tim, and I don't know if you've known Joyce, but she's here in our church. She wrote a great book on prayer. The title of it is called The Thread of Worship, but it's all about prayer. Worship is a form of prayer. She says in her book, and she's talking about praying for her kids, and when we pray for our kids, what are we really praying for? That Their safety, their health, and all of that. She says, in the end, he may give us exactly what we've asked, But to what end do we ask that he grant mercy to the child who has sinned unless that child first repents with godly sorrow that turns him to a closer walk with God? Usually, repentance comes with some kind of pain on the front end. And us us parents don't like to pray those prayers, right? Because we know that there might be some pain for our kids to turn to God. She says, God is not interested in heaping good things on us just to make us happy in life. He wants his kingdom come in our lives here and now. In short, God wants to be glorified in our lives today. Now, if you don't know Joyce, she was diagnosed with cancer recently. She's had the surgery to take it out, and now she's on chemotherapy. She's not here today, but she's likely watching online. I'd encourage you to pick up her book. I think there might be a couple copies still left here. Go on Amazon to look at it. It's a great book. I've read it a couple of times. Let's look at another reason that our prayers aren't answered. James 1.6. 1.6. Sometimes it's wrong motives. James 1.6. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. James is talking about asking for wisdom in a time of a trial. Because the one who doubts is like the wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. Think about all of that crud that was in the ocean and the river this last week. Tossed around being blown around. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Well, what does it mean to be double-minded? Just ask your friend, your neighbor right here. What do you think it means? Go ahead, just ask. What do you think? What do you think is double-minded? Okay, don't point any fingers. Don't point any fingers. It means to trust God here, but not to trust God there. It means to believe for God in this, but not to believe God in that. It means to take his word here, but not take it there. The double-minded person, again, like all that debris just bobbing around in the ocean, extremely dangerous to anybody who's around it, by the way. Remember that when you're doubting. Double-minded. So double-mindedness, literally unbelief. A form of unbelief. I found this little poem in a book uh, by Charles Crabtree called Shattered Dreams. I encourage you to read that if you're going through something difficulty. As children bring their broken toys with tears for us to mend, I brought my broken dreams to God because he was my friend. But instead of leaving him in peace to work alone, I hung around and tried to help him with ways that were my own. At last, I snatched him back and cried, How could you be so slow? My child, he said, what could I do? you would never let them go. Sometimes that's what we do with our prayers. We don't really give them to God and surrender them to him. We want to take it back again and take it back again and take it back again because we try to work our solution instead of trusting God and waiting on his timing. That's a form of unbelief. This occurred to me this week when we were praying together. Somebody prompted this thought in my brain. When you're praying, do you give instructions or do you report 
uh, your duty like a sergeant, like a private? Do you report for duty, sir? Or are you giving God instructions? Let's look at one more. The Apostle Paul, he called it his thorn in the flesh. This last one was unbelief. He calls it the thorn in the flesh, his struggle. Somebody you know this? Uh, some people uh, uh, guess on what this is. He said it would not go away. <clears throat> some say it was his speech impediment that he had. Some say it was uh, that he had malaria and kept getting sick. Others say it was migraines that he had. Others say it was just lust. Others say it was some person in his life. No one really knows, and I think it's vague for a reason, because we all put our own thorn in the flesh in there. Listen to what 2 Corinthians 12, 8 says. Three times, by the way, this is likely three seasons of his life, I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for, say it with me, my power is made perfect in weakness, therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness, so that Christ's power may rest on me. Let me remind you, this is Paul. Paul who wrote a third of the New Testament. If you've got a cup with a verse on home, at home, a verse on it or on the wall, you can thank Paul for it. It's likely from the New Testament, right? You look at Paul, the one who was beaten, the one who was shipwrecked, the one who chose to follow Jesus, the one who sent his word out to the known world, but he was stoned and imprisoned. All these things that happened to him, He prayed and he begged and he pleaded, yet he had this close relationship with God. He was probably good in his relationship. He was likely asking with the pure motives, and his faith was likely strong. But God did not answer his prayer the way that he had asked. Paul helps us see that even in an unanswered prayer, God is up to something very different. This is what I want you to see. It could be that God has a different answer. He has a different answer in your unanswered prayer. Maybe you prayed for a house. Maybe you prayed for a job. Maybe you prayed for a spouse. Maybe you prayed that your marriage wouldn't die, and it did. All that stuff happened. Maybe you prayed for the person that got sick that you love to, to, uh, to stick around, and they weren't. They, they're not here anymore, and your prayer isn't answered. God, why didn't you remove the thorn? Why didn't you do that? And God, in his own way, in his own time, listen, he's going to show you why. Maybe not even in this life, but in the life to come. But oftentimes, he shows us uh, his answer in unanswered prayer. Let me show you what some of those might be. First of all, his answer is no. It comes out as no. No, he wants to change your motives. You're praying for all these things, but Ron, I want to change your motives. Imagine if God answered every prayer with a yes, every prayer even those with wrong motives. What kind of world would we have today? Crazy world, that's right. What would happen if that happened? What would happen if you did that with your kids, answered every request that they had, every single one of them, right? They'd be spoiled little brats, corrupted by their own sin. I love your kids too. I mean, come on. That's what happens. Some of you know this. Proverbs 21, 2 says, a person may think their own ways are right, but the Lord weighs the heart. To do what is right and just is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. So allow God to change your motives. Allow him to do that. Weigh them. Pause. Think about them. Ask God to help you. Lord, is this right? And then next time, it's not just no, no, but it's slow. Slow. He wants you to wait. I know every single one of you are great at waiting. I get it. You're awesome at it. I'm not so good. Am I the only one? No. None of us love to hear the word wait. It's usually a timing issue. Again, back to our kids. Is it really a great idea when your kids are begging for a mobile device in elementary school? It's not a great idea, right? Most wise parents say, not a great idea. Has your life really gotten better because of your mobile device? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Well, yes and no. Yes and no. I, I don't know. It's not the evil of the mobile device. It's what's going on in our hearts. Do you want to give that to your early teenage son or daughter? With unfiltered access in secrecy. Just saying. Sometimes you have to wait. So you tell them, wait. Just wait. Wait. God says that to you too. Isaiah 40, verse 28 through 31. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord 
is the everlasting God, the creator of all the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary. Hallelujah, right? And his understanding, no one can fathom. Let me underline, double underline that. You did that in your Bible. No one can fathom. You don't understand God's ways, right? He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary. Young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Teach me, Lord. Teach me, Lord, to wait. To wait. I've found that the very thing that God is oftentimes doing while I wait is more important than what I'm asking for. It's huge. You got to wait. And then the next one is grow. So the first one, no, slow, grow. God wants to actually work on you. You can't keep uh, your life open to God and for him to work and still hang on to a grudge or bitterness or hate or asking with these impure motives or the lack of faith. Listen, we're all under construction. We got to be honest. You got to come to God honestly. Look at John 15. Jesus is saying that the father is the gar- gardener, right? right? The, ultimately, he, he comes to cut off every branch. He trims it clean. He says, He cuts off every branch in me, c- cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he trims clean so that it will be even more fruitful. Listen, God wants to to give you a season of blessing and growth in your life, but he's got to come to you. He's got to come to you with his his trimming shears. I don't know what you call those. I'm not much of a gardener, but he comes to you and he clips off the deadheads, right? He clips off all the stuff that's not growing. It was at one time, but right now it's not. And so he does some pruning and he prunes on you. And that sometimes is painful. Pruning hurts in your life. And oftentimes, the greatest, the greatest lessons and the greatest character development in your life is when there's pain involved. Why is that? I don't know. I want to avoid the pain. But I know this. When God is wanting to take the, the, the cancer of sin out of your life and take what's, what's actually got wrapped around your heart, he will take the scalpel of his spirit to you and he will pull out, which it may hurt and maybe for a moment really hard, but eventually you will be healed so that he could take it away. The last one is to know. He wants you to trust him and experience his goodness. Just know him. Oftentimes, we ask God for really, really good things with right motives. And that prayer, again, it doesn't get answered. And like I said, I don't really know why about your specific situation. Isaiah 55, 8 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Let that sink in. Neither are your ways my ways. Say his thoughts are different. I could say that. Yes, his thoughts are different and his ways are different than yours. He says, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. If you're in the middle, listen, in one of those seasons where you're topsy-turvy, you don't understand, God's not answering the prayer. There seems to be no explanation going on. All I can say to you and point to, to, to ultimately one person, and that is Jesus. Jesus knows, God knows, he's sovereign, he sees you, he knows where you're at and what you're struggling with, and you're not alone. So turn to him. You see, the temptation is to turn your addiction. The temptation is to turn to anger and disbelief. But I'm telling you this morning, and you're here for a reason to hear this, turn to Jesus. Turn to him. Surrender to him. Say, I don't understand. Listen, he can handle those questions. He can handle what you're bringing to him. And if there's unbelief, say, Lord, help me. Help me. I'm trying to believe but help me in my unbelief. See, what I want you to see is that at the heart of the gospel is an unanswered prayer. What did Jesus pray in the Garden of Gethsemane? Father, if it's your will, take this cup from me. What was the cup? The cup was the cup of suffering he was about to receive. It was coming to him. And his prayer was, take it from me, Lord. Take it from me, Lord. Take it from me, Lord. What was God's answer? He didn't take it from him. Jesus surrendered his will, not mine, but yours. What if God had said yes to Jesus' answer? This is his question. What would have happened? There'd be no cross, no resurrection, no salvation for your sins. There'd be no 
church, no Holy Spirit. Where would we be without Jesus' unanswered prayer going to the cross? And what I want you to see is that he understands very well what it's like to have an unanswered prayer. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're here this morning, every, everybody, just out of politeness to the people around you, here in the room, heads bowed, eyes closed, I want to pray for those who want specific prayer about an unanswered prayer that you're confused by and you're struggling and you're willing to admit it, but you're coming here this morning, you're just going to raise your hand and say, I'm surrendering to God. That's you? Raise your hand. Yes, 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 out in the courtyard. Yes, yes, yes. Father, you see these hands raised and they're raised in faith to you that they don't understand all that's going on, Lord. But Lord, we recognize that you do. We, we confess the promise in your scripture that no eye has seen, no ear has heard. No mind can conceive what you have in store for those who love you, called according to your purpose, called according to you. Father, we can't see that right now, Lord, in our situation, but we come to you humbly recognizing we need you, Lord. We, we want to put our, 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 our focus and our efforts and our mind and our hearts and our wills at your feet and say, shape us and form us. Help us to see what we can't see. Help us to surrender to your working. And we ask it in Jesus' name. And listen, if you want to have a conversation with God and you never have really had an honest conversation with him, that one of the best prayers that you can pray is, Jesus, forgive me of my sin. I know that I'm a sinner. It is by your grace that I come to you. I want you to lead my life and be my Lord. I confess to you and recognize and admit I'm lost without you. And I come to you asking you to be my Savior in Jesus' name.